so who would you be in the like um crime heist group thinking like the brains or the hacker like the guy in the chair you know the driver who do you think you would be i'd be the buzzkill pointing out why it's not going to work is that a ta- archetype <laughs> No. So you, you realize the... we could all get caught, right? So you, <laughs> you realize the... it's going to happen. <laughs> so you're the planner. You're the contingency planner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'd be terrible at the con artist because I don't lie well ever. Like, <laughs> not even trying to. <laughs> I was trying to think of any one of. Clever, being clever, and maybe it's the mastermind or brains, but like the. The cut artist, I was like, I... <laughs> I think I think Anna would be great at being the brains because she loves trivia, so she knows all Ooh. this just random info. So th- I think that yeah. would be great for her. Uh, I think I'd probably be the hacker, the driver. Um, you know, the um, obviously cybersecurity here. Love that the hacking. You know, computer side of things, but I also love cars, and then also. Um, What's the the movie, The Italian Job, where they got the loaded up Mini Coopers? Uh, that mm-hmm. one was always a phenomenal movie to me as a kid. So um, loved, loved that part of it. What about you, Tara? <laughs> My gosh, I kind of wanted to do like all of them, but I I was just thinking like I would m- like to be the planner. Like I would have our plan and then task mm-hmm. be like, all right, now you guys are going to go here and do this. And once you've completed that, I need you to like go to the next step. So mm-hmm. I would just make sure that there's the execution following, like we're going to get this and we're going to make it happen. So between nice. you and Matthew, we're going to actually make a successful heist somewhere. Yes. Nice. Challenge accepted. I'm I'm going to add another one, which I don't think is on our mm-hmm. list of archetypes, but I'm okay. also the one who who reference so many other heists as it happening that we all think there's twists coming. <laughs> like some random person is walking down the stairs and we're just like, isn't that your partner? Like in Ocean's Eleven? And they're like, no, that's a stranger. Stop. Stop. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> How about you, oh, just the wrench in the work. Um, I think out of our list that just leaves the muscle. Oh. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to. That's why I am. That. Oh yeah. I, it, this is. It's a good thing this is an audio <laughs> podcast for most people because uh, yeah, there's no muscle here to be a uh, wow and by. So <laughs> How dare Ariel, Ariel's I'm ripped. like the smallest <laughs> one out of all. <laughs> yes, you're petite. I, <laughs> But I got us. I got us covered. Don't worry about it. Our group will succeed. Karen and I have the mom look down to like steer people into submission. So mm-hmm. I think that could be worth something. I love it. We got all of our bases covered. And then Matthew, who's following us around, just throwing <laughs> wrenches in the work. Yeah. Bucket of cold water on everything. Here's why that won't work. Also reference to thing no one else has seen. Perfect. I love it. That's great. That's great. Well, um, I mean, no heist is complete. We've got Nate, our hacker, uh, which is fitting because today we're talking about cybercrime. Uh, Tara and I are joined by, by Nate, our director of cybersecurity and our quality assurance analyst and GRC specialist and Matthew, our VC. So, um, and just to kind of open it up, I don't know if we want to start with when we're talking about cybercrime, what are we talking about? Maybe some terms just to kind of level set for our audience on what we're talking about. Definitely. Um, we've done a couple of podcasts now on certain things like this. Uh, if you haven't, definitely go back and listen to them. Uh, so we've done a, a podcast on the IC3 report from this year. Uh, you, we've done you know, a couple others as well, including the Verizon uh, yearly report. And those kind of break down what those crimes are. We go into a lot of detail of what those numbers are. But in short, cybercrime relates to anything or any type of crime that impacts a business or individual that is done using uh, computers or or telecommunications of any kind. Uh, That is a very broad scope, and it does mean things move into and out of cybercrime. 
it's a big problem at the moment with defining what is and isn't a cybercrime. Uh, but that's because there's a lot of scope to it. There's a lot of things where people can get pulled into something that previously wasn't. Suddenly it is. Uh, now it's a different, you know, organization that gets involved. The majority of it comes down to ransomware uh, on the business side, um, scams, very big one as well. People just trying to get money rather than getting anything else. The, the gamut of real crimes, but just computers are involved. Yeah, there's we could probably break it down a couple different ways, right? Um, and this is where some of the the nuances will come in about, you know, what's the full scope that you want to really focus on? Um, we, we could go deep either way. But um, in terms of the the business side of things, you know, Matthew had mentioned, you know, the ransomware is the, you know, some of the social engineering, which is essentially trying to exploit human behavior in order to gain access to systems, information, something along those lines, right? That could be phishing emails, uh, calling in and having someone illicitly um, provide that info, you know, vocally there. Um, otherwise, there is data theft, right? So insider threats, that could be something where you have a disgruntled employee who is intentionally taking data. Um, so that's just a very, very high level of the business side. You could even take that to um, just personal cyber or, you know, in general cyber crime. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there. We can go deep into this in a little bit, um, but really there is always some type of motivating factor behind um, the intent to commit this type of cyber crime. Um, I guess I could maybe a uh, quick mention just a few of them I, and then maybe we go deeper. I'd but... like to mention one thing quickly, just kind of yeah. building on from that. There's there's one other thing that we talk about when we're differentiating and that's internal versus external crime. So external crime is when the initiator is external to the organization. Um, this is really a business side of things, but someone who's not a part of the organization Internal is when it's someone who actively works for the organization. And generally, if we're talking about internal, we're talking about someone who is acting maliciously. So someone falling for a phishing scam is not an internal crime because they they aren't meaning to. They were tricked by an external actor. Uh, there's a little confusion around that. So I just like to clarify that first. Internal, when we mention it, is someone who is actively choosing to cause harm to an organization internally. That may have the appropriate access. It it applies to say your family environment as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so. The the quick breakdown, and this is mentioned in the IEEC report, is that that's about uh, four out of five threats, and this is across all industries for business, are external. Um, we're looking at you know averaging out across all businesses about eighty percent right are external actors rather than internal. So. External is far more common. Uh, just want to mention that again, because I know inside a threat can be a little scarier sometimes, but basically four out of five are external from that business perspective. Sorry, back to you, Nate. Yeah, no, you're good. Uh, before we go deep into some of the, the actual cybercrime and the activities there, um, one of the things I just wanted to mention is, you know, why does it even happen? And I started touching on this a little bit is there's different reasons why someone may be motivated to do this. Um, financial motivation is by far the Huge. number one. Um, you know, if, if you go take a look at the Verizon report that recently came out, it accounts for about 94% of all data breaches um, is there's some type of financial motivation to it, you know, whether or not it's trying to process wire transfers, ransomware, stuff like that. Um, extortion. So, you know, maybe there's a, you know, a threat actor group called Caricurt. They typically don't even ransom files. They just take them and say, I have your files, give me X amount of money, uh, and then I will just delete them, right? They don't cause actual impact to the organization other than everything you have to deal with due to data loss. Um, another one is just grudges. So this could be, again, disgruntled employee. Yeah, you know, Maybe someone worked there, they got fired, now they're upset, um, that kind of stuff. Espionage is another big one. Um, it's not as common, but it does especially happen at the, the government or the um, 
the critical infrastructure side of things, you know, your oil, your gas, your electricity, uh, people trying to gain additional info to use for later um, exploitation or um, just information gathering for other, you know, nation states. So those are state sponsored uh, from other or um, nations there. Convenience with the corporate espionage too, where mm -hmm. stealing from a corporation on their intellectual property to exploit and sell when it's not yours <laughs> in the first place, but to for the monetary gain or or notoriety gain. This is kind of a pivot, but the corporate espionage side of things is definitely one of the things that got me interested in cybersecurity in the first it, place. It, it um, is. It's crazy. <laughs> just people knowing that you're releasing a product and then being able to release their product first so that they get the buzz from it. Uh, you know, it's it's there's so much that goes into what these crimes are and what their purpose is um, that cybercrime doesn't mean crime that results or requires a, you know, digital like ending like you're not getting mm -hmm. money from the computers that you're stealing or something it's about what the process is and what's used to commit the crime yeah <clears throat> three last ones and i'll make it really quick i promise uh is convenience you just happen to come across a company that's doing something very insecure let's just say it's remote desktop that's wide open that's a way to connect to computers Oh, I don't happen to uh, ha just log in just because it's there, right? And then go commit crime. You can't just do that. That's a, a felony right there. Um, ideology. So this is where we see things like, um, I'm just going to go pick on WikiLeaks, for ex example, right? Is there's the I ideology that, you know, the government is misbehaving. They want to expose that. So there's some type of info um, or motivation there. And then sometimes it's just for fun, right? There's there's no other intent other than they're just curious. Um, so one of the ones that uh, come to mind right off the bat is there's a great report out there about some students who wanted to rickroll their entire district. Um, and so all they did was they... Yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> yeah. This so is these, Minneapolis right now. Yeah. It's in the yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah, that, that and this one came out a couple of years ago, I believe now, um, where these kids got into the... Um, the uh, chime system, all the projectors, you know, the the video player for the school announcements. Um, and then they just thought it would be funny. So they just did that. And then while they did that, they also wrote up a full pen test report and they came clean and provided it to the district. And they weren't punished because they did such a good job documenting their work. Um, so if you're a school administrator, that's a, that's a little disheartening there that your students are actually very, very skilled at computers. Um, and oftentimes students have some of the most time in the world, uh, right? Instead of playing with friends, let me just go hacking, hack things, right? Uh, we just saw that with things like Uber, right? I believe that one was a 14 or 17 year old, but it's still some type of minor, right? It, so there's... Firstly, definitely not recommending kids do that. <laughs> you, they should have got in trouble um, just because that is a crime. It's dangerous to be doing that. Um, I, I, I agree with your point, though, about time. Um, many of you may have heard about the Lazarus Group. Um, yes. To my knowledge, and I haven't heard anything recently, there have not been official charges placed or anyone committed for that, but the People who were arrested for it were teenagers in the UK. The the person who was apparently the ringleader was 16. Right? This is not someone who, A, may be fully aware of how bad what they were doing was, right? Um, but at the same time, they're not doing it for the same type of gains or for the same reasons that most people are. Maybe it was, you know, it started out of a boredom or I can't believe this worked type scenario. We see that a lot when it comes to people finding flaws in uh, environments. There are a bunch of tools, no, I'm not going to name them, that allow you to scan ports on systems just on the internet. Uh, you can do it pretty much very easily. And so if you know what you're doing and you have some skill set in that, or maybe you're bored and have a lot of time, finding flaws in systems is possible. This is why we do vulnerability scanning and external vulnerability testing, because mm -hmm. That way we find it before someone else does. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of the, the number one reason is capital gain. It is money. 
And that, depending on the industry, ranges from 70 to, you know, 95, sometimes even 100% of the reason that these crimes are committed. But the reason for that is that that is a good motivator. Um, so when we're, look, when we're talking about what you're seeing and why you're seeing it, most of the time, monetary gain is the reason it's being done. Whether that's a secondary or tertiary gain rather than the primary gain is secondary in the case of like espionage, for instance. But people are looking to get money. And the amount of money is where things start getting really fun because the organizations that go for incredibly large scores, considering our heist conversation earlier, <laughs> um, are different to the people who are going for the small numbers. And that main difference is generally, are they going for individuals or are they going for businesses? A couple of years ago, um, I say that was probably pushing five now, um, many, many iCloud accounts were hacked and the devices were locked. From what I remember of this, the cost to get those devices unlocked was only a couple of hundred dollars, definitely less than the cost of a new device um, at the time. So they weren't taking tens of thousands of dollars from or hundreds of thousands of dollars from a couple of businesses. They were getting two or three hundred dollars from 10,000 people. And that's kind of, I, I think, one of the biggest differences we see between the internal and external um, attackers here. It's across the board. There's a real shotgun analogy of we're just trying to hit as much space as we can and see what sticks and who's going to run back and give us money. Which is why we always recommend not paying a ransom right out the gate. Speak to your insurance, speak to whoever you need to find out why. If you're being directly targeted, if you are just the result of someone else being targeted, uh, there's so much to what's going on and there's so much benefit that these organizations get from trying to impact as many people as possible rather than trying to get incredibly large amounts from one people, uh, from one group of people. The, I guess uh, two quick thoughts here. Um, if you have no idea who the Lazarus group is that Matthew talked about, um, there's a book and a podcast called The Lazarus Heist. Go read about it. It's phenomenal. Um, it awesome. It's it's one yeah. of the core reasons why the United States had to redesign their hundred dollar bill. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but otherwise, in terms of you know Matthew's comments here about rather than you know maybe want to lump sum that they're trying to gain, right? Threat actors they know that and they're trying to adopt their tactics to elicit different ways of gathering money. Uh, so actually right here on my other screen, uh, I'm looking at a website that is dedicated to ransomware and this this threat group, they will take that data, they'll post it online, and then there's three different ways that they gather revenue. Uh, they will, oftentimes with ransomware, they will um, have a timer saying, if you don't pay within a certain amount of time, we will leak your data. They have a payment method saying you can extend the timer for another 24 hours for X amount of money. Uh, you know, and it might be $10,000, $20,000, something like that. There's another way that says delete all my data and get rid of it, right? This would be like a, um, for the company that got compromised, you can pay X amount of money. The one I was just looking at was $5 million. The other one was same price. $5 million, but anyone can download that data before the timer is released. Um, and so there's three different avenues that they're trying to take from the same cyber crime, uh, which just, again, is showing that these tactics are evolving. Um, and oftentimes with ransomware, I'm not going to go too much deeper, I promise. Um, to put additional pressure on you, they will actually call your company saying, I know that you got compromised. I am from that threat group. Tell someone to go take a look at the um, website and start negotiating with us. And then we've even seen it before where the, they start calling your customers and trying to have your customers pressure you to pay that. Um, you know, so the tactics are changing rapidly on the cybercrime side of things. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I could keep going. <laughs> I love ransomware. Uh, not not supporting it um, or endorsing it, but 
it's just a very interesting um, process. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I want to make a quick fix there. Um, I did say Lazarus. I meant to say Lapsus Group, L-A-P-S-U-S. -S. Um, Lazarus is an absolutely amazing uh, situation that occurred, and definitely those books, are, uh, the book and podcast are fascinating, which is why I misspoke. Lapsus is the group I was thinking about. Um, and I just want to clarify that because it would get confusing uh, with what I said before for Lazarus. That did not make sense. Um, secondly, uh, one of the things that always blows me away with the the ransomware side of things that you were talking about, Nate, is just how good the support of some of those websites are. Firstly, the websites look more professional than your average website does in general. And on top of that, they have incredible support teams on hand that they're paying large sums of money to to guide you in how to pay their ransom how to buy bitcoin quickly and easily so that you can send it straight to them it is horrifying how well they've corporatized that side of things yep. you also <laughs> mentioned you know the threat of it calling people up threatening them tell calling their customers um this is you know threats that these are things that we see done elsewhere but when they're put here and you're also feeling that that pinch of your data being gone or missing or just inaccessible that's a lot uh and it yeah. does work and and that's kind of the next thing i wanted to talk about with this which is the biggest what was that oh sorry i was just gonna say my favorite because with these ransomware negotiations is when you join the chat and it says hi how can i help you today it's like, you know how you can help me. So like, high quality customer service. Exactly. It, like, I mean, this call is being they, recorded. I, I'll, I'll say one thing and then I'll let Matthew keep going. But these are oftentimes full organizations, um, you know, so just like you have your own business, they have their own business. They've got sales, they've got support, they've got engineers, they've got, you know, leaders of that group you know managing the different teams so um so that's my little blip there but matthew sorry no no i'll uh, i'll not to jump into that too much there there was a, a ransomware group that came up the other uh, about a year or two ago they were only around for six months and they made something like 38 million dollars yeah of course they have a whole team it makes sense mm -hmm. if they're going to make that much money and then they disband and move on um to to go back to to what I was saying, the the most effective way that these these uh, criminals work is by making you feel fear. And when they make you feel fear, they make you feel a sense of time criticality. If you've ever received any of those emails requesting that you buy, you know, uh, something to do with you know gift cards or anything like that. You know that when they're doing that, they're saying, we need this or we'll lose a customer. We need this or we'll lose X, Y, Z. I need you to pay this right now or something bad will happen. We've seen some truly horrific ones come around more recently. Um, we may get into those later. But the general point is they're going to try and say, you have to take an action that you don't think you need to take or that you should take without speaking to anyone else so that we can be sure we fix this problem that you haven't yet confirmed exists. Ransomware is a bit different, obviously, because you can probably see your data disappearing or getting crypto locked right in front of you. But generally, when it's a phishing or a scam or anything like that, there's a don't try to confirm this, just pay us. Um, that is, to me at least, a surefire sign that what's going on is not legitimate. If you start feeling that fear happening, if you start freaking out like that, hey, I know taking a step back or getting off the phone is pretty hard. Generally, most things are not that critical, right? Business deals, they tend to take a little bit of time to go through. They don't tend to get signed in a full afternoon for ridiculous amounts of money, especially not with gift cards. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go into those types of it. But when it comes down to what you can expect if you're being uh if you're the target whether that's intentionally or otherwise is that there is going to be that there is a sense of urgency of time criticality and that you the person they're speaking to are the only one who can fix it if that feels out of place if you're feeling 
oh, that's not quite right. I, I, I'm i feeling really out of my depth. This is not something I should have to handle. There's a good chance it's not. There's a good chance you can take a step back because personally, I would prefer getting, you know, reprimanded for not having done something like that than the opposite of it. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't really feel comfortable doing that right now is a much better thing to have to say than I'm sorry I sent $10,000 in gift cards to someone. Um, so I, I think that's something I just wanted to recommend is looking out for. Uh, obviously, the, the whole conversation before that about ransomware doesn't really tie in, but <laughs> it's uh, it's just something that came up with with what you were saying, Nate, because they do push it. And it's it's very true in the ransomware side of things because they want that money quickly. They want to resolve the issue because then they can move on to handling it for or committing the same crime again. Um, that's the business side of things. On the personal side of things, just be on the lookout for it. Yeah, the, uh, I guess I'll see if I, marketing has any questions, but I would love to just give a little bit of depth into just certain types of attacks, you know, maybe not even to the, the corporate level, but then talk about some of the steps or the roles that happen in these various ones and sometimes how they're chained together. But um, yeah, Tara, Ariel, I don't know if you had any questions before we try and dump into something like that. that no, that I is mean, one. Yeah, sorry. That That is one key element to keep in mind that it's typically not just one kind. It is several married or mixed into um phishing can then be a virus then a, then and then um it's it's really hard sometimes to differentiate and then try to figure out the the point of both attack and control to remediate it the, it's hard to separate yeah. the different different elements because the reaction is is going to be different as well exactly yeah, and just before you kind of jump into that Nate just to build on there and the the forensic side of things of, of what happens after these attacks when people are trying to figure out how it all started is one of the most intense things you can think of because it requires that the person doing that work knows every step of your system every piece of hardware if if you get if you fall for one of these crimes and it does end up getting to that point the entire system gets ripped apart because the people need to figure out exactly where it occur occurred, how deep into the network someone got, things like that. Um, and so it's the reason for that is, is like Anne said, it builds. You fall for a phishing scam, you then download a file and it gets on your network. Suddenly it's on six computers and the server and it's extricating data elsewhere to, the, to another network. And so what started as just a phishing attack became a full-blown ransomware event with a full forensics team coming in afterwards. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, there's so much going on and it is tied together. It is just, you very rarely just fall for one thing. You end up falling for multiple things that results in it. So if you're feeling uncomfortable with it at any point in the process, stopping there is a good thing because it often means if they're jumping onto another one, they're either trying to get deeper into the network or something in place has stopped that first one from working, uh, <laughs> which is a great way to know that if they're trying to pivot midway through, you can also stop. Uh, maybe make things less bad than they were before or could have been. Sorry. Yeah. So to blend the two of your guys' um, conversations together there, uh, one example that comes to mind is a phishing email, right? Someone falls for a phishing email. And this is going to be a, a legitimate case that CIT has helped uh, assist with as well. So um, a user had clicked on a phishing email unbeknowingly granted access to their mailbox then and that could be a whole different threat actor so they they sent off an email their entire job is just to gain access to accounts that's it um then from there they can potentially sell that access and then someone else can come in and maybe that team is focused more on wire transfers and so what they can do there is they'll that team will just sit there and monitor your emails for a given period of time waiting for the perfect opportunity for a wire transfer. Uh, so Matthew had mentioned, I need the gift cards. Um, in a different case that CIT has assisted with, it was the CEO was flying back from China uh, for business. And while 
they were flying. The threat actor knew that because they had the flight details, emailed the accountant saying, I had a great time here in uh, China. I'm looking to do a business deal. Please immediately transfer, you know, it was $283,000 to be able to secure this deal. Uh, they processed that. It went over to another country. Uh, by the time that the CEO got back, uh, they said, can you send another one, right? And that's that's where the accountant said, um, hey, by the way, I processed the first one. Do you want me to do the second one now? Is that I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so again, a multi-chained attack that started off with phishing, someone monitoring emails for a while, led to a wire transfer. Um, and that's actually pretty common. We've done that. We've seen that multiple times. Um, but yeah, otherwise there's so many different other ways that this can happen. So uh, I've seen different groups working together. So some will set up the servers just to deliver ads and then they'll rent that out. Um, and then there's people creating malicious ads and they'll use that service to um, pair that all together and make a malicious uh, advertisement system. We've seen things like, we haven't talked about SIM swapping. That's a SIM swapping is basically just where you convince the cell phone provider to change the SIM card from one phone to the other, because that's often where multi-factor is tied to uh, for text messages. Um, oftentimes there's someone who is holding the phone, someone who is trying to convince the uh, retail employee to sidestep processes, someone who is trying to gather the multi-factor code at the same time, and they work as a team to try and accomplish that. Um, the two other ones that I'll maybe quick mention is there are teams that are dedicated to just gaining access to networks and then stopping and then selling that access to others. So for example, we've seen it where someone will break into a network and then they'll sell that access for $600 or something like that. From there, they're done. That's their specialty. Someone else who maybe specializes in ransomware and there's groups out there that um, you can buy their ransomware services. Um, and so you essentially don't have to be a coder. You just say, I wanna buy this for X amount of money. You run that in the software. The people that developed it get a portion of that money, and then you get to keep the other portion because you did the crime. Um, it's it's wild uh, out there. Uh, you can hire hitmen. Uh, I don't recommend that. Uh, also, I guarantee that 90% of those sites, that if you ever go trying to look for it, are FBI <laughs> just trying to get you. Um, we see all that. We see that all the time. But um, it's it's a full underground business. We'll just leave it at that. I, I think you make a good point that's often overlooked when we talk about this. People think of the the people committing these crimes as the hackers, as the people who have spent so much time learning how all this works that they know how to do it. And to be blunt, it's not really that anymore. It's a lot of people who just have enough money to buy a version that is currently known to work. And then they send it to people because if a known company who's doing who's done this multiple times can make 36 million or 38 million dollars in six months someone can just make a million or two million dollars doing it on their own with a little bit of scripting work with, with my compliance mm -hmm. mind reeling um <laughs> there is also the element of of plausible deniability and separating the the individual crimes so if someone were to be convicted or brought have charges brought against them the idea of stealing one access or a group of access is not as as terrible as gaining access stealing information selling information it's all the different steps aggregated that would be the true and and the monetary gain of course or or the the separation of of the monetary gain to stay under the radar of what's what's important to say the FBI. Mm -hmm. We're always going to keep it at a, a $4,000 steal. But again, like you were mentioning earlier, a thousand times, then we're at millions of dollars, but it still was under the radar of of the the controls set by different agencies and, and crime bureaus. Yeah, exactly. I'll, uh, I want to mention, um, we, we've talked about, you know, 
a lot of what what is done. Uh, I think we've mentioned a lot of things that haven't really shown any consequences, and I just want to mention a couple of those quickly. Um, people going in and buying data, people going in and buying access, there are sites where that can be done. Nate mentioned that. One of the big ones that got shut down recently was be breached.vc. Not only did they get shut down, um, they were raided by the FBI. The owner and creator of that forum is currently under arrest, um, or as is as of our last update on the matter. And all the information from that site was given to the FBI. Right? That those people who use that site, those people who signed up just to look at it, they're on a list now. There is something that, like just being curious about this in specific ways is going to have that. Um, we sign up and get certifications and specifically work with the good guys because that, you know, shows that we're doing this for research and because that's what we're doing it for. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to know where this is happening. But this is something that is actively charged, actively reviewed and investigated heavily. Um, Anne's right. There are limits to what that money basis is before they get incredibly involved, but they're tracking all of it just because they haven't found enough reason to focus on one individual over a giant group yet doesn't mean that the time won't come when they do. Yep. And if you're right. making these types of mistakes, which you are, because it's all trackable, you're going to be caught. Um, it's just a matter of time for how long. Uh, and we, we see this with, with the Silk Road guys who thought they were getting away with so much for so long. Um, fun, fun fact, he actually got yeah. tackled in a library. Um, so <laughs> he, he was on his laptop and they swooped in and tackled him. And his laptop is now in a museum if you're interested. But um, the one thing I, I'll kind of put my closing thoughts because I think we did a lot of great work telling how fun uh, or like interesting <laughs> the cybercrime could be. Um, interesting and, is different than fun though yeah <laughs> i did say hey that there is a motive of being just having fun um but i guess the the one thing that i maybe summarize for my closing thoughts and it's kind of writing on matthew as well here is um these are old statistics so please don't hold me to it but the last time i looked into this it was about five percent of all cybercrime has a conviction but if the FBI or some other type of investigator agency gets you in their sites, it's over 95% conviction rate. Um, so we also often hear stories of people who did get caught, and it's usually one IP slip up at some point. And then that was the main way that they were able to track and start putting that to a particular individual. Um, and so the risks... You know, if if you're going to commit cybercrime, which we don't recommend, you can make a lot of money, but you always run the risk of saying, when is my time to get caught, right? And oftentimes that it's not even that you may be slipped up, but there's a, a bigger picture that starts developing. Um, there's a podcast out there. I'm not going to go into the gritty details here, but there was a website. It was a fairly small site, but it was sharing questionable content that's highly illegal and they found one individual's uh, bitcoin address found that individual got them convicted and then that turned into a couple hundred arrests uh, because one person slept up so even if they you do everything you. perfect yeah even if you try and do <laughs> everything perfect again the fbi and the other agencies have the resources and the time uh to hunt you down essentially uh, and make sure you are convicted and brought to justice. Yeah. Bruh. So that was a very yeah. light closer there. Nate. Yes. <laughs> like, Wouldn't that have but a I heavy really like heart? <laughs> um, I, I've always said yeah. if I ever don't show up to work one day, it's because I'm either in jail making very good side money or I got hit by a bus. So, um, <laughs> I'm still at, here at work, which means I'm not a cyber criminal and I am not hit by a bus because I fear the felonies and the time of being convicted. Oh, man.
Wow. Well, we we are very happy you are here and not hit by a bus. We've got some well, good people. Crimes. Yeah, we're cre- yeah, committing crimes. <laughs> F- yes, we've FBI got some good people be on all our side. This podcast now. I know. Oh my gosh. Um, well, kind of to end, I'd like to end a little bit on a high note, just as everybody's kind of worried. Um, some of the things. If you had to pick just one thing, because we will have a podcast in the future about best practices and what you can do, um, but what would be some advice um, that you would give a person or a business? Um, I think Matthew, uh, I'm going to take his about just trusting your gut. I think it was a huge thing. If it doesn't feel right, um, stop, back up, talk to somebody. Um, But if there was anything you had to share about how to help or prevent or best practice, Have a full incident response plan, have full internet security policy, basically have a GRC analyst, as I've said in every, (laughs) (laughs) because, and, and I've said this during every other podcast about this, but every time I've talked to someone who has said, oh, we nearly fell for one of those scams, but didn't, it was because they had rules or policies in place that were like, we always get double confirmation before we send money. So someone came to us and said, someone asked us to send all this money. And the other person went, wait, because they didn't have the time crunch. The first person did. They could see the reality of what was going on. Policies and procedure will save you more times than any specific tool. Policies and procedures and tools will save you even more. I, I'd say start with the basics. Um, that Drunk is password management and MFA. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've mentioned this on other podcasts. I have sunglasses that are engraved with MFA everything. Um, and it is because it is so critical. Um, usually what we have conversations with customers about is, you know, you can implement some of these basic security tools, multi-factor, endpoint detection response, um, and you could pay for those for 10 years at the cost of one cyber incident, right? And they will absolutely help you far more than, you know, that 10 years there. Um, And so it's just blocking and tackling the basics that if you are joining this for the first time, please just implement multi-factor wherever possible, especially your VPNs, your email accounts. Those two alone will help out a lot. And the impact to your end users will definitely be significantly less than the impact to your users and your mental health if you ever have to go through a major security incident. Um, I'm going to quick touch it down a little bit uh, on the the high part is we've had business leaders crying on the other end and we have to play the empathy to help them through that situation. I don't have business leaders crying to me (laughs) when they're talking about implementing multi-factor. That's more of just a slight annoyance. So... Um, again, start with the basics. Yeah, for sure. All those things, we've got podcasts on all of them. We'll put some links in the description. Um, thank you, Nate, Ann, and Matthew for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, if you need any help, uh, please reach out to us at info at cit-net.com or head out to our website, cit-net.com slash podcast. And we'll be back next week with an all new episode.